Um, my name is Amy McGehee, and I'm the chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine. So i um, happy to be able to host um, this distinguished lecture series today. Um, first, I want to acknowledge and thank the School of Medicine for um, the opportunity to invite a distinguished lecturer. I wanna thank Colin and Lena for all their help in coordinating. Um, the Distinguished Lecture Series was developed by the School of Medicine more than 20 years ago. Uh, faculty members submit nominations for lectures that are nationally and internationally acclaimed experts in their field and have garnered recognition for their outstanding research and publications. These speakers are not only distinguished scholars, but also effective communicators. Each lecture is chosen for their ability to address contemporary issues in basic or clinical sciences, providing valuable learning opportunities for our residents, students, and faculty. So we have excellent uh, person who's joining us here today. I'm going to introduce to you uh, Dr. Kurt Stange, who is a family and public health physician at Case Western University. He is the director of the Center for Community Health Integration, which conducts collaborative research and development for community health and integrated personal care. He is a distinguished university professor and professor of family medicine and community health, population and quantitative health sciences, oncology and sociology. He conducts multi-method participatory research and development to understand and improve the generalist function, primary health care, health equity and community and population health. He is a member of the Academy of Medicine and the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. We've already had so many wonderful conversations over the last two days, and so I can't wait to hear what he's going to talk to us about this afternoon. So please welcome with me Dr. Kurt Stange. So it's, it's fun being the out-of-town uh, expert, and uh, people expect to learn from you, but I've really learned uh, a lot from folks uh, already here. So I was just saying that when I was Cancer Center Associate Director, I looked at how much effort we put into studying the mechanisms of cancer and how we use that to design interventions to try to make things better. And we're doing a lot of things to try to improve primary care, uh, to uh, make things better so we can have a better effect on population health. And yet we don't really spend any energy on looking at how it works and the mechanism. So that's why, that's why I'd like to talk about that, uh, that a little bit today. And then uh, we can talk a little bit if we have time at the end about how to actually, how to actually do that, uh, that kind of work. Um, before we start with that, I'd like to call out some work that a colleague of mine, C.J. Peak, who's in the family medicine department at the University of Minnesota, has done. He's a lexicographer. He looks at how we use words. And he, he asked the question, what do we mean by population health? And I, I bring that up now because I'm sure Dr. Shipman is, is uh, seeing this quite a bit. We mean different things uh, by uh, what we mean by population health. Occasionally, we can use that, uh, the different understandings to do things we don't expect that we're going to do, but, but it's, it's actually an issue. And what CJ did, he talked to quite a few people that are feeling different parts of the element of, of population health. And I'm not, not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I just want, want to kind of rec recommend this paper to you if you're doing work in that area. First of all, he looked at the differences people has in the goals for what we mean by, by population health. And pretty much everyone is agreeing it means health, uh, health for whole, whole people. Uh, and people that are doing population health work often are looking at what can be measured. So how can we turn that into measurable terms? And then there's another group of people that really look at this as community health. And what differentiates community health is it's a group of people, but that have some shared identity. Sometimes it's geopolitical for people that share, share some identity. If you're really trying to improve the health of a group of people, and you're looking at how that, how that works, Having people that share an identity is an important pathway to, to doing this work. Um, he then looked at what are some of the realities of these things affecting population health. And it's humbling for those of us in, in healthcare. We have such a small effect compared to all the social and environmental effects, and we have such a profound inequities. So that's a big part of doing population health. If you really start looking at the health of a population, it's really hard not to look at the inequities and try to work on, on that. Um, and then, then different ways of getting the job done. So in healthcare, we tend to look at the people that we are walking through our doors if we're providing healthcare or if we're in more value-based care, we have accountable care organizations who are the people we're responsible for taking care of. But then we look at what's really causing their health problems. And that's where we find collaborative opportunities because we realize that we can't just work on that with our vertically indicated one disease at a time programs. We need to look at kind of horizontal integration, things that are working across systems working at the interface with the, 
with community. And that's where we get involved with public health and people that are doing community health and social, social agencies. So it's just, as we're doing population health work, it's worth, worthwhile sometimes finding out what we mean about this. Okay, so now what I really plan to talk about. So there's an interesting paradox of primary care. Um, there's a large body of evidence that shows that primary care is associated with less evidence-based care for individual diseases. So name a disease, someone has done research that compares a generalist doing that as part of what they do to someone who just focuses on that and finds that the generalists provide worse quality of care uh, by evidence-based guidelines. And you look at this literature and say, well, why do we even have primary care? Why do we even have generalists? And then there's another some other lines of inquiry though, that raise their gaze from the level of the disease to the level of the population, and that find even on disease specific quality of care measures, that if you have more generalists in an area, you have better quality of care. So there's something interesting going on. Apparently, if you see a generalist, you get less good disease care, quality of care measures, at least by the evidence-based guidelines for that disease. And then you raise your gaze to the, whole, the system. And if you have more generalists, the quality of care in the whole system is better. So there's something going on there. And it maybe has something to do with how the specialists make the generalists better, the generalists make the specialists better. But we need to understand what's going on with that. And then systems that are based on primary care have better population health. So less, apparently less evidence-based care of diseases, but the health of the whole group is better. And they somehow do that with lower resource use and, and less inequity. So that's a pretty good definition of, of value, better health of the population for less money and less inequities. And yet how we actually try to understand quality of care, how we try to improve care tends to be based on these one disease at a time, evidence-based guidelines. And the mental model that if we actually thought about that's underneath that is that somehow if we get all the parts right and add that up, the whole is better. We clearly need to get the parts right, but there's some other function that primary care does that's about the whole that we need to understand a little bit more about and figure out how to value a little bit. So when, when Dr. Shipman, Dr. McGahey, McGahey um, contacted me and asked me to do this and talk about population health, I said, perfect, I'm ready to do that. Um, I just uh, did a couple of editorials uh, on this and I just had a chance for the uh, 100th anniversary of the Millbank Foundation when they had 37 papers in an issue on population health. I had a chance, I was working on the paper on primary care. I said, this is a chance to get it all down and I'm gonna be really ready and I'm gonna have it all, all together. And the, the uh, journal wanted 3000 words and I gave them 10,000 and they wanted uh, less than 150 references. I gave them 500. And we ended up with uh, 9,300 words and, uh, and about 250 references. And I, the reviewers didn't really ask for much. So I got to put down everything I knew here. And, and I've been working on this for 30 years. And I don't know that much. It was incredibly humbling. How does this actually work? And I think those of us who are clinicians have an intuitive feel for this. I think people that do public health work um, have a sense for how this, how this works but I don't think we have a deep understanding. And the problem with that is that all these patches we keep putting in our pregnant system, particularly ones to improve primary care, um, are actually, I think, making a lot of things worse. I think they're, they're increasing the fragmentation of care, increasing the depersonalization of care, adding in a lot more administrative burden, putting a little bit more resources for a lot more administrative burden. And each patch just adds weight to the system and doesn't make it, make it worse. So, I'm not gonna have an answer here, but I hope you'll struggle with me a little bit and think about what some of these mechanisms might, might be. And the way I'd like to talk about that, I really will talk about these more as hypotheses. And I wanna to, want to start by giving homage to uh, Barbara Starfield, who's a pediatrician health services researcher. Uh, a colleague of mine calls her the, the high priestess of primary care. She described primary care as being the bringing together of, of the four C's. People call these the Starfield's four C's. So she says primary care uh, is the first contact accessibility. So it's being accessible. If you, don't, if you need to get some healthcare, you have a health problem, you have a concern, you, that's, where you, that's where you go. You don't have to um, decide what, what disease you have, uh, you can get in. It. And it's interesting how we 
organized care now because it's really, really hard to get in. So we've almost kind of lost this in how we're organizing care. And then I think this is a key thing, comprehensiveness. It's, it's, a broad, it's a broad focus that we have in primary care. And there's lots of things that come out from, from that. When you do surveys to the public, they're also concerned about that. Well, aren't you a jack of all trades and, and a, a master of none? So people don't really understand this, but there's something magical, I think, that happens from these together, and particularly from that comprehensiveness. And then coordination of care across a fragmented, uh, fragmented system. And then continuity of care. And what we mean by continuity of care is seeing the same person over time. And what we really mean by that is relationship. We have a relationship context for care. Uh, Barbara says, said that these things actually work together, that you can't, if you just try to optimize one without the other, it causes problems. And there really are trade-offs in, in this. Um, in our, a lot of our systems, we're really trying to increase the uh, accessibility to care. Uh, and what we do, we, we get people into the next available slot that we have, and that flies in the face then of continuity of care, of getting them in to see someone who, who knows them. Or uh, as we're trying to uh, make, make care more, uh, more accessible to, to everyone, um, we, uh, we say, well, well, we're more doing chronic disease management now. And if you have an acute problem, you need to go to urgent care. So that gets in the way of, of, of a lot of these things. So th there's a bunch of trade-offs in all these things. I want to just drill down on that comprehensiveness and think about more about what happens from that comprehensive approach from folks and the whole person, not just disease. First one is prioritizing. I think that's probably the most underappreciated aspect of, of primary care and maybe why systems based on primary care have better outcomes. So all clinicians prioritize. I mean, what's the most important thing I can do? But it's really different if, you're, if your care is focused on one disease. Your first question is, does this person have one of the things that I'm an expert in? And if not, well, go back to your primary care. There's something different that happens when you're prioritizing based on looking at the whole person in their family and social and community, uh, community context. Um, one thing that does is it gives you a better chance of knowing them as a person. You need that context. Um, the, the founding chair from my department, Jack Medality, uh, when I came to Cleveland 35 years ago, he told me how he approached patients. and He couldn't see someone for a cold without doing a family tree. He absolutely needed to know that context for taking care of, of, of people. But you start with that as a focus you're already starting to invest in the relationship. And it's almost, it's almost like a bank in which you're making a deposit. You make deposits over time, you gather interest. So when there's a new, a new you know, potentially fatal diagnosis, a family crisis, a new, a new twins in the, in the family that's gonna disrupt everything, um, uh, you have a relationship bank that you can, you can draw on. So we work on the parts, but we're working toward the whole, the health of the whole person. We tend to put things more in context. That's what happens when you start with, with breath. We have the potential to be a force for integration and we really invest in relationship. So that's just one example of how I want us to think about things. And I, what I'd like to do is I have uh, way more slides than I plan on actually talking with you about. So I'd like to think about how some of these things might work together because I think primary care isn't one thing and most of our efforts to improve care focus on one aspect and don't recognize the trade-offs. And if you, if you optimize one part of a whole system, you risk doing damage to the whole system. So I wanna at least think about some both and things, how a bunch of things might work together. And I'm actually gonna ask you if you have any interest in any of these, we'll use that to guide what we talk about. So one thing the primary care does, one of the mechanisms is it does focus on evidence-based care of single diseases. I mean, we, that's a lot of our quality improvement. When we do quality improvement projects, that's typically what we, what we do. Um, but we also tend to multiple problems and undifferentiated illness. A lot of things we'd see just don't fit neatly into, into little neat boxes in which we have scientific, uh, scientific evidence. And then most people coming to the hospital next door here certainly have multiple chronic conditions as well as acute problems. The same thing in primary care. Multiple studies showing that most people coming through our doors have multiple problems that they're, they're attending to. And so just optimizing the care for each disease at a time doesn't necessarily optimize the whole. But we have to do both of those, there's a tension there. So we do that, we do a, a provide care for acute and chronic illness, and we do prevention and mental health care. And actually, I like to talk about integration of care 
uh, in addition to coordination of care. Coordination of care is what we do when people are getting care from multiple places, multiple, multiple venues, multiple other clinicians. And we try to bring that together and make that a whole. Integration of care has something to do with how we help people to manage their chronic illnesses, try to sneak in a little bit of prevention, deal with what's actually bring people in today, keep our eye open for mental health issues and family, and family issues. We take care of the individual. We also focus on the family and the community and the population. And there's a dance back and forth between those two. We work on process and on the, we pay attention to the outcomes. We try to be accessible to care uh, and, and provide continuity of, of care. And when we're designing systems, when we're designing how we get people in to see us, that's a real tension that we have to somehow manage. Um, people trying to improve care have suggested that we need to franchise a lot of operations. And there's a lot of venture capital going on into franchise models for primary care right, right now. And yet there's interesting research showing that primary care isn't one thing. It's, it's different things in different social political contexts, different things based on who the patient population is, different things based on who's actually providing the, the care. Uh, we do a lot of work. A lot of our evidence-based guidelines come from borrowed evidence from uh, from, from evidence done in academic health centers like, like this that, that we end then to apply to a less differentiated population. But there's also a generalist knowledge base. We have scientific ways of knowing, knowing and then personal ways of knowing that we bring together. Um, when you're trying to improve the different disease-specific aspects of care, it feels like the other aspects of care are competing demands. And yet, for some of this added value of primary care for population and personal health, it's sometimes helpful to think of them as competing opportunities. Um, my colleague Becca Etz and I have done some work looking at the simple rules that might explain generalist and specialist uh, care. And then primary care is a discipline, but it's also a social movement. Um, so does anyone want to, I, I can talk about any of these. Does anyone want to particularly drill down on any of these in particular, anything you're particularly interested in? So we'll, we will talk about that. Nobody ever wants to talk about that. Thank you for asking for that. Anything else people want to make sure we drill down a little bit more? I'll just use my favorites. It's OK, Scott. Thank you. The, uh, the simple rules is my favorite, so I'm happy to do that, and we'll do the individual uh, as well. Love this group. Nobody wants to hear about these things. These are good things. Okay. Yep. Let's start with mics. And, and uh, by the way, the, maybe this is something if you don't know what is, is news you can use. If you're in the projection mode of PowerPoint and you hit the number of your slide and return, it goes to that. Um, so I have a list of the number of all the slides. So that's what I'm going to do. So we're going we're gonna to go to uh, Mike's uh, slide 44. So I had a chance, uh, there was a project called the Future Family Medicine Project about 15 years ago when the discipline of family medicine said, well, we're in trouble. And a group of folks got together and eight papers were commissioned. We hashed that out for four days. I got asked to do the research paper, which by the way, is the worst thing to do. You have a group of pragmatic family physicians and I'm supposed to do the research paper. I said, oh my gosh. It was specifically done as an intergenerational conference 
which made it really, uh, really interesting. So you just didn't have the old white haired guys like me pontificating. You had people that were in training and people in the middle that were actually trying to keep the trains running on, on time. So it was a really interesting, interesting framing. And uh, I was uh, asked to do a paper with someone else. They said, we were gonna ask you to do it with Ian McWinney, but his wife's sick and he's not gonna be able to come to the conference. I said, oh, Ian McWinney is like the father of primary care and family medicine in North America. Um, could, could I call him? And so I'd never met him, I called him. And I said, if, if I just come up and sit at your feet and you talk, can I type? And he said, sure, that's okay. And I said, can I bring my friend, Will Miller? So I did. And we flew up to, uh, to London, Ontario. And I was sitting in the back seat of the car when Ian picked us up at the airport. And I had sent out an outline for this paper. And they both said, good outline. We'll work on your outline. And, uh, but while we were driving to his office, they were both talking about some work by a philosopher named Ken Wilbur that they'd read. Has anybody read anything by Ken Wilbur? I'd never heard of him before. I was like watching a ping pong match as they went back and forth talking about this. And they, they talked about how Wilbur talks about these different ways of knowing include this personal way of knowing. And, and I said, let's do the paper based on that. He said, no, no, your outline's good. I said, no, let's do that. So here's what Wilbur says. He says, there's four ways of knowing. He says, there's an inner reality, how we know the world through our own personal experience. And there's an outer reality that we often say, this is the objective world out there. And then he says, in, in those aspects, there's an individual component of that and a collective component. And he says, this inner individual is the I reality, the stuff that Mike as a residency director is trying to convey, uh, where you need to know this person who they are, and you need to know who you are. And then if you're gonna be together with them, you need to kind of start to think about who you are together. And then we're doing evidence-based medicine, right? And we're trying to affect population health. So there's these, uh, these it's is this systemic way of knowing, and then there's this it reality. So I said, this is really interesting. I'm sitting in the back seat enjoying this and said, so how does that relate to health and healthcare? So this I reality is who we are, who's the patient that we're, we're seeing? What's their personal experience? What's their worldview based on their experience? We're kind of slaves for our own, own experience. I mean, that's how we, that's how we see the world. That's how we get to know the world. Um, and then who am I as a clinician? Um, I think when we're being skillful as clinicians, we're not just one way. We, we are different things to different patients and maybe even different things to the same patient at a different time. But you have to have pretty good self-knowledge on that. And then who's this we? We're do, doing team-based care. Who are we together as a healthcare team? Who are we together as members of a community if we're going to be trying to take care of individuals and then saying, you know what? One person at a time, we're pulling them out of the, out of the stream. Let's look and see who's throwing them in the stream upstairs. Let's raise our gaze to the community. And then we have our disease and our treatments. And then this, this kind of uh, collective um, way of knowing, this collective objective way of knowing is, is, is how we understand systems, how we develop, look at the system knowledge. How do we work together as a, as a complex system? So I don't know, that probably didn't help you in how you teach this, but I think the idea that uh, we need to know who we are. I mean, one thing I did from the, after writing this paper is I said, you know what? I have these different ways of knowing and this I way of knowing, uh, I have, okay, I have a sense of that who I am with in nature. I have a religious practice. I don't really have a personal factor. So I've been meditating for 20 years since we wrote this paper, trying to develop that, that sense. And uh, I'm not just trying to develop these evidence-based guidelines. I'm really trying to say, who are we together developing these evidence-based guidelines? Well, at least that frames a little bit about how I approach things. I wanna just follow up and I do the single or multiple disease and then we'll do, uh, Scott, we'll do your individual family, community, and population. And actually, I kind of think of these as, as a way of having some conversations. So we don't have to just wait till the end if you want to say anything more about these. I guess I'll just leave that as an open invitation. I'll run to you with the microphone. So let's see. We're going to go to slide 10. So I'm going to 
So we do both evidence-based care of single diseases and attend to multiple problems over time. So we all know about our evidence-based guidelines, but I wanna think about a policy example of this. So in the federal government, we have 27 or 28 now NIH institutes. A few of them focus on groups of people, most of them focus on specific types of diseases. The Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research is where primary care research is supposed to live. Uh, it gets 0.2% of the federal research budget, by the way. But their biggest initiative that they've ever done in primary care was called Evidence Now. But even this place that primary care research lives, uh, so more than $100 million, um, they, they got 1,500 small, medium-sized practices, 4 million patients, and tried to do quality improvement for cardiovascular disease prevention. So this is their biggest primary care thing, focused pretty narrowly on one disease, one aspect of, of prevention. Uh, uh, and looking at the average uh, cardiovascular disease risk, um, it was 10.1% before and 10.03% after, um, which was statistically significant with 4 million patients. But boy, $112 million, uh, 1,500 practices, not, not big, and it's just a small example. And I was part of the national evaluation team looking across these seven practice-based research networks. Um, one of the things that the networks did is they said, okay, we're gonna work this. This is what we're used to. This is how we get resources. We'll take it for this one disease. We'll do this. We'll use this to develop some infrastructure in our practices that work across other diseases. Maybe we can do some things for people with multiple chronic conditions. But that's how we've been trained to work. We get the resources come for the narrow thing and then we try to focus it on the, the broader things. Um, and we do tend to deal with multiple problems per visit. Uh, I did a couple studies uh, with some folks looking at the medical records and found that the, looking at medical records, an average uh, 10 minute visit to a family physician, uh, you address three problems. Uh, if you're over 65, four problems. If you're diabetic, five problems per visit. So we do tend to a lot of problems. These are some of the competing demands that we, that we have. And I, I had a health services researcher named Sherry Boland, who is a general internist, and she came to Cleveland. She's a good health services researcher. And I said, Sherry, you're going to spend most of your career seeing patients and then sitting at your computer looking at these big data sets. And I said, for this year of your fellowship, how about if you just go on the ground and just look around and qualitatively and see what happens? And she was really interested in diabetes quality of care. And so she took the practice in our network that had the best diabetes quality of care uh, measures, and she did some ethnographic work around that. And I said to her, just for fun, look at how many problems come up during a simple uh, diabetes uh, uh, follow-up visit. And she went away for six months and did that and was reporting on her findings. And I said, oh, what about that side question about no problems? How many? She said, oh, yeah, that was interesting. I said, well, what's the answer? How many problems come up during a diabetes follow-up visit? Does anybody have a guess? Ten, a bold, bold guess. Any other guesses? Twelve, even <laughs> even bolder. Five, four, four or five. Okay. Um, she said twenty-five, and I said, "Oh, come on, that can't be right." And she said, "Well, go look at the data," and so I did. Turns out, ten problems come up before the the physicians even seen the patient. So if you have a practice that's well organized for, organized for disease management, the medical assistants documented the blood pressure, done a little medicine, recon, reconciliation, done the glycosylated hemoglobin, done a quick um, mental health screening, a PHQ-2, reflex with PHQ-9, if that was, if that was, posit was positive, done, the, uh, done, done a couple other things. Um, and if they're all normal, the clinician just looks past those, great. If they're, if they're abnormal, those get attended to. And turns out the glycosylated hemoglobin is way out of control. It was pretty good before. Well, why is that? Well, you know, I, I, um, I, I can't take my medicines. Well, why aren't you taking your medicines? Well, I left them at, uh, at where I was living in my boyfriend's apartment, and I had to leave suddenly. Well, why'd you have to leave suddenly? Well, he was abusing my daughter, I found out. Oh, well, so we're probably going to re-prescribe the medicines and do other things. But suddenly, this is not just a simple diabetes follow-up visit. That's that prioritizing function. That's that competing demand. A lot of times, maybe the diabetes quality measures don't look so good for that visit. But in multiple visits over time, you have a chance to work on the things that are affecting the diabetes quality of care 
the things that are affecting the people's quality of life and the, and the life for the, for the family. So there's all these competing demands. Okay, this one's for you, Scott. Shout out if you want to say something. Okay, both the individual and the family, community, and population. We've already talked about this, how most of our efforts to improve care are primarily focused. So um, quite a few years ago, I did a study called the Direct Observation of Primary Care Study. Uh, I love that study. We directly observed 4,454 visits to 138 family doctors in our practice-based research network in Northeast Ohio. Um, and uh, really detailed information. We classified every 15 seconds of the visit into 20 different behavioral categories. So time budget stuff, checklist of what was done or not done uh, during the visit. Did patient exit interviews, did clinician interviews, uh, looked at the medical record, looked at the billing data, collected 2000 pages of ethnographic field notes. So really looked at how care was happening we were funded to do it as a prevention study. We went in with the idea of competing demands. What are the things that are getting in the way of doing our evidence-based preventive services and found some things along those lines, but came up with the idea of preventing, of competing opportunities. But this is my favorite thing we, we looked at. One of the things that we discovered there is we defined, Sue Flocky came up with this idea of, of family members other than the identified patient and found that during 18% of visits, care is provided to a family member other than the identified patient for that visit. Clinicians are nodding knowingly. I, I, I'm looking around the room here. Um, this is almost never seen. We hardly ever saw this in, the, uh, in either the billing data, so we're not very good about charging for this, and it doesn't appear often in the medical, medical record. Half the time, this person wasn't even in the room. Um, but this is an interesting added value of care. This is a way that care is contextualized for the individual. It's a way that care is provided for the, for the family in their, in their context. Uh, we looked at the, how, how the family comes up and uh, um, uh, it's 10% it's of the time of the visit, 10% of the time of the visit is spent discussing the family. Um, family members are present during a third of the visits. This was back when we were before electronic medical records and we had family trees in 11% of these, of the, of the visits. Um, interestingly, and a lot of us had family charts. Um, none of that got transferred over to the EMR. We did a bunch of work developing systems for automated uh, by telephone or, or computer, getting family, family history information that then presented a nice genogram and uh, couldn't sell it to any of the any of the EMR companies, because we were told there's no business model for that. And found two styles of, of focus on the family. So there's and very little overlap between the two styles. So there's some physicians that focus on the family history as context for caring for the individual. So I want to, I want to know if someone had breast cancer or ovarian cancer in your family at a, at a young age or an MI at a, at a young age. And that's a risk factor for, for you. Uh, there's another group of physicians Oh, and those physicians had higher rates of preventive service delivery. There's some that really focus on the family's theme of care. So I, I do your genogram and I put all the diseases and then I use it for putting kind of social stuff on there. And each time you come in, I would just add a little bit to that. So I develop a, a richer picture of the, of the family. And I use that to contextualize care, to know when there might be a teachable moment for, for something where I've been nagging you about your smoking for two decades, you know, for a few years. And we said, and you say, stop it already. Okay, we have an agreement. I'm not going to nag you anymore. But then you bring your, your grandchild in, and I mentioned for her third year infection, I mentioned that having a smoker in the household triples the risk of getting hepatitis media. And now you're at a teachable moment for, for that. It's context for caring for you. And those patients report that the doctor had greater knowledge of the patient in the, in the family. I'll just mention this idea of community oriented primary care. When I was training, this was, a, this was a big new idea that you would actually look at your practice as a population. You would gather some epidemiological data, uh, some social data, and use that to help organize how you did your, did your practice. And um, this was done by a bunch of zealots. 
and around the country, different people that were interested in, in, in this. Uh, Sidney Clark brought this model from South Africa and it never really took off because there wasn't infrastructure. Now we have a data infrastructure for that. And we're trying to figure out when we're doing population health, how to figure out how to do this linkage of data, which you have on the whole system and our group of people and what you have with people that are taking care of the individual and figure out how do we go back and forth between those two. Um, and just the last two slides on, on this, uh, this topic. So these are the data that look at the quality of care and find that um, the more general practitioners you have, and that, that's generalist of all primary care ilks in, in, across the 50 states, the better the quality of care is on six, um, six chronic diseases as measured in, in, in Medicare. Uh, so more generalists, you have better quality of care at the system. Um, this, is, this shows the number of specialists for 10,000 and find this the number of specialists goes up that the quality of care goes down. Now that obviously doesn't mean we don't need specialists and it's probably context dependent about the US context that we have just an imbalance in the system. If you did this in other countries that had half their workforce doing primary care, you might see the opposite effect, but it speaks I think to the fact that generalists and specialists help each other to be better and that we don't have the right balance in the US. And the next one is the process outcome one. So who wanted process and outcome? Okay, okay, Th thanks DT. Um, so there's lots of things we could say on this. Here's what I decided to put into this. It's probably not what you're expecting, but um, uh, I was fortunate to work with uh, some folks that were doing some research on healing. And actually one of them, John Scott, actually I had two physicians who came to me for help with doing research on healing. And both of them were between 20 and 25 years into practice. And both of them came with basically the same story. They said, I've been practicing for a couple of decades. I've seen some amazing things that I really can't explain. And some people have had this healing that I can't really explain. I want to look into that a little bit more. That's a hard question to help people try to answer. Um, they found similar things for what people mean by healing that, healing that Tom Agnew at the University of Washington, who's a social worker, uh, found. When you talk to people about what they mean by healing, they say, cure, please. If you can cure me, I want to not have this thing. Uh, but most people that we're seeing have chronic diseases. They have, we have a lot of things we try to help people with that we can't provide a cure. But what do they want from us in that situation? Uh, Agnew called this transcendence of suffering. So they want help with living with this. They want help in drawing meaning from this, how to get on with what's important in their lives despite having, having this. And this, doesn't, this often doesn't feed our egos very well. It makes us feel really good. I made a great diagnosis and I made a cure today. I don't, don't have the other mic on. That feels really good. This is harder work. Uh, I have to suffer with you uh, on, on this. I have to help you, help you through this. So John did a, did a study then where he identified six clinicians by various ways that were thought by their colleagues and their patients and their peers to be good healers. And he interviewed them and asked them to each identify six patients that they thought had experienced healing. He didn't say what healing was. And he did in-depth interviews. We spent a lot of time uh, looking at this. And this is the model that emerged. And so I put this under process and outcome because it includes both there. Uh, so I'll do the pointer here for those that are remote. So there are certain clinician competencies that we need to, we need to bring to this. We need to know our stuff, we need to know our, our medicine. And we, need to, and we need to have some self-confidence about that. We need to know ourselves. We need to do that, that inner individual reality that Wilbur talked, talked about. We need to know who, who we are. We need to be mindful about that. And we need to use our emotions as another source of data. And we need to use them. We need to have, be able to manage them for the best interest of the, of the patient. Sometimes that involves um, partnering to the patient, lowering the power differential that we, that we have. 
uh, so we can educate people using our special knowledge. Sometimes it involves uh, you know, pushing people. So, uh, and, and some of us sometimes, some, some of us have a hard time with, with people. No, we wanna really relate to people. But sometimes we need to say, no, you need to do this now. Uh, and we need to, that's a hard thing to know when to do what on, on that. But clinicians that are good healers appreciate that power differential. It can be different things to different people at different times. Well, it's just like my computer at home. I have a hard time finding the notes. Um, I'm just going to do it verbally. Um, patients talked about how we are with them, how good healers are with them, and they have a way of making them feel valued. And we do this by having a non judgmental stance, by finding ways to make connection, and by having a presence in, in there that gives them full attention in the encounter. I have a friend, Paul Thomas, who's a general practitioner who between patients, I spent a couple days with him, between patients, he stands outside the door, and he just shakes a little bit. I said, what are you doing? Uh, I thought he was having a seizure the first time he did it. He says, no, I'm kind of shaking off that last patient, that last patient so I can be fully present with this one. Paying attention to the illness experience. Sometimes we need to suffer with them. I mean, how often do you know, 30 seconds into the visit, I know what the diagnosis is, I know what treatment I'm gonna prescribe. And if I just do that now, it's not gonna land. I need to suffer with them a little bit. I need to understand their experience a little bit and maybe I'll learn something that'll help me either here, either here or along the, along the way. Uh, and then uh, at the bottom here, abiding was the word that we used to label this, just being accessible to people uh, during key moments in their, their lives, during major health events, committing to not giving up, not saying there's nothing more we can do for you. Um, being, being with people and showing that by various carry, carrying actions, even if we're not seeing people in the hospital anymore, making sure we follow up after they were in the, in the hospital. And over in the top left, that leans to the, the healing of the outcomes of a sense of hope, a sense of trust, and a sense of being known. So we've done some other analyses from these data that look at the, at the healing journey, but this has a little bit of the process of what we need to bring to this, what we need to be for people to help them in healing then how that leads to different outcomes. And actually one thing I don't have here, I'll just put in here. I actually believe that there are higher levels of knowledge and actually Wilbur talks about a holarchy as ways of knowing where a higher level includes but transcends the one below. So at the bottom level here of this holarchy of healthcare, we have what I call fundamental care. It's our evidence-based management of, of chronic diseases and prevention it's care of people's acute illness, it's paying attention to their concerns, and psychosocial care. The next level is integrated care, where we're looking at across their acute and chronic illnesses, mental health prevention. How can I bring that together? How can I, just biomedically, how can I prescribe one medicine that's maybe a second or third line medicine in the guideline for each disease, but that actually hits them so they can have not 12 medicines, but go down to four different medications? Or how can I find a health behavior or something I can do with the family that helps across those different, uh, those different aspects of care. And then there's prioritizing care, bringing together the biographical and the, and the, the bio, biotechnical and balancing all these different things that we can potentially do for people. And then there's this thing that we do when we can't actually provide cure that we discovered in this model that, that's healing transcendence, sticking with people even when healing can't be, be fostered. And that probably has something to do with you know why the research seems to show that in palliative care, that not only does it reduce people's symptoms, people live longer when someone's actually doing this and sharing the, uh, the journey uh, with them. Um, and my, I showed this to my friend, Will Miller. And he said, oh yeah, this lowest level is physician-centered care, this kind of disease-specific care, which by the way, is the only thing we know how to measure and the only thing we have tools in our EMR to support. Uh, the next level is patient-centered care where we're trying to integrate care the next is goal-oriented care, where we're trying to look at what's important to the person. The next is relationship-centered care. Okay, let's do franchise. Yep. So um, we've talked a lot in our system, and, and our, our, our dean talks a lot about compassion. And um, there's a, a book that's been through our system a lot about compassionomics and this idea that um, uh, when you have compassionate um, people who are caring, providing health care, patients have better outcomes and it, 
it is an, it makes economic sense and, and all the, these other reasons that it's important to be compassionate providers and that it doesn't take a whole lot of time too to, to provide a compassionate action. Um, what I've struggled with when we talk about this is that compassion is a, it's an action. It is, a, it, is a, it is a response to alleviate somebody's suffering. And what you, you mentioned here just a second ago is this idea that sometimes we don't alleviate suffering. What, you know, what you're saying is, is that, that ability to transcend. And in fact, sometimes we've caused the suffering. And so in this ability to abide by in this, where do you, do you see additionally that ability to fold in measures of compassion with that? Because I do see, I see that this overlays with what we've been talking about in our conversations about compassion. So I'm just kind of reconciling those two together. But I just, I think that it's, it's not just the transcendence, but it's, I've been unable to, to alleviate your pain, but also I may have caused your pain in some way. Exactly. I gave you a medication that you had an interaction to. I did a procedure that didn't go well. You know, lots of ways that we unintentionally harm patients. Because um, so much, so that gets to doing our own inner work. And like, it's, it's, it's really painful for us when we've hurt someone. Um, it's painful enough, enough for us when we're telling the person we're not going to keep escalating their narcotics, that we need to do some other things. They're usually pissed off with us at that uh, that moment we're doing for larger good, but we need to do our our own work ourselves and then with others to kind of work on how we feel about that. Dr. Stanky, can you hear me? Yes. I have a question that came through on the chat with this hierarchy of healthcare, and somebody's asking about how important it might be for a team-based type of approach when maybe you don't have the time as a physician to offer that healing and transcendence to sit with them or to work through some of their healing um, can you speak to the team-based approach and the importance of that? I think you kind of answered it in the way you set up the question, right? We can, sometimes we, we can't do that. And if we can do a warm handoff uh, in the practice of someone who, who does have more time, and if we can recognize, if we can be available for follow-up to people, uh, recognizing that sometimes a little bit over time has a, has a big effect or some combination of that. So so using teams and using a commitment to being with people over time is certainly a good way of, of doing that. And, and I think to Dr. McGehee's question also to, um, to look at designing our systems so that they're compassionate for our, ourselves. I mean, it's really hard if you're, if you're really beaten down by the, by the system to be what we wanna be for our patients. So other questions or people, things people want to say or things in the chat or people that are on Zoom want to say anything? Dr. Shipman? Um, so uh, I want to... Uh, maybe build on that last question about the, the role of the team in primary care. And you opened up with talking about Barbara Starfield's four C's and, and um, uh, we, as a system, not here, but nationally, haven't really moved to effective team-based care as the norm, but it sure talked about a lot. Um, and I'm curious about your thoughts of the physician or clinician as the deliverer of the four C's um, and that relationship basis for primary care being a person-to-person -person relationship versus being a person-to-team relationship. And what, are the, what are the strengths and weaknesses or promises and limitations of, of team-based care in that context? 
It is so hard because there's not one way to do team-based care. And the idea that the clinician isn't the only one who gets the relationship is a really important idea. And I think mostly how we've set up teams is, is that everybody else kind of sets up the clinician for doing that. Um, I think the idea that others have different kind of connections and that those need to be valued is, is important. I mean, I saw in the, your, you know, the, the training practice here that you do huddles at the beginning and of, of each, uh, each half day of, of care. I think that's a, that's a great way for how you actualize that. And, you know, just thinking to my own practice, I'm mean, I have a, a, had a medical assistant who really was pretty much like a lot of my patients who was a ex smoker and, you know, she was a little cautious at first, but saying, you know, here's what I did with this patient. I hope that's okay. I said, oh my gosh, that is so much more effective than whatever I was going to do. Yes, keep, please keep doing that. And so I think when we, when we talk about real patients and real things and look at what people's strengths bring and bring the idea to that, that um, if, we, if a team approach means that there's diffusion of responsibility, that we're just delivering our commodities of care, that becomes a problem. If we recognize that we're delivering commodities of care and we're investing in the relationship and that everybody who has a chance to invest in the relationship should do that and we try to value and support that. And one of the things we need to do as physicians is really value people doing that. One of the things that we lost in our centralization is the kind of front office person who used to greet people and answer the phone. And so often now, do you have centralized call schedules, call, uh, schedulers here? Um, that is efficient. It looks really good on a spreadsheet when people are out. It's easier to manage that. So from a managing personnel on a spreadsheet, and I think that looks really good. It's, it's efficient. But there's a huge um, loss to that um, from people who could hear the tone in Mrs. Jones' voice. Uh, and say, oh, she needs to get in today, or Mr. Jones never calls. Oh my gosh, Mr. Jones calls. Let's get him in right now, even though it sounds kind of mild because he tends to underplay, underplay things. So, um, so valuing that relationship uh, is really important. I'm going to leave you with the simple rules. Um, it's a little bit uh, in answer to how we measure this. So my colleague, Becca Etz, uh, did a big crowdsourced survey of what hundreds of patients, hundreds of primary care clinicians um, say matters, say is important in healthcare, delivered an 11-item delivered an, uh, delivered an uh, measure. I'm going to flash in front of you here just for a second. Uh, this is called the person-centered primary care measure. Uh, it's being mandated by CMS to use in the in primary care first. It's next initiative. It really is you can be useful for focusing on attention on what patients and clinicians say matters in healthcare. It's a complement to our disease specific care measures. Um, so Becca analyzed this data and we, we developed this measure based on that. But we also, when we were um, looking at the at the data from these hundreds of patients, hundreds of primary care clinicians about what matters in healthcare. I asked her to look at this from the idea of simple rules that in complexity science, there's an idea that you can explain really complex behaviors sometimes with a few simple rules that interacting together lead to complex emergent behavior. And uh, Becca said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, it's, um, so it's like the flocking behavior of birds that can be explained by simple rules. So if, if, you're, if you're a bird and you're, you're getting ready to go out uh, with your other fellow birds, um, these three simple rules explain that flocking behavior. First, they look and try to line up with those that are close by. Then they try to say, okay, where's the center of mass that's emerging? Let's try to steer toward that as this center of mass emerges. And then you try to keep about equidistant from your neighbors around you so you don't collide. And I said, so those are the simple rules that explain bird flocking behavior. And after wowing these data, which is the week long retreat, wowing all this qualitative data, I said, Becca, what are the, what are the simple rules for, uh, for primary care, for general care? And she, we did a lot of analysis to support these, but this is basically what she said, uh, just off the, off the top of her head. She said, well, well, I'm gonna do the specialist ones first and how do specialists approach it? So specialists approach care, 
Um, you try to identify and classify disease for management. You're really working on what the diagnosis is and in your area of expertise. And then you have a management strategy based on, on your expertise for that disease. You interpret that information through specialized knowledge, and then you manage a plan for care of that disease. Generalists start a little bit more broadly. They kind of try to recognize and make sense of a broad range of problems and opportunities. So you're focused not just does this person have, person have what I'm an expert in, what's going on with, with them? Is there a teachable moment here? Is there an opportunity to promote health? Um, or is there a problem that they're having that I can do something about? Um, and then we try to prioritize. And how do you prioritize? How do you prioritize these 25 freaking problems that come up? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say freaking. 25 problems that come up in a, in a diabetes simple follow-up visit. Well, you say, is there something I can do here that will promote health? Is there a teachable moment for prevention? Is there something I can do for healing? Or even if I can't do both those two, can I do something to invest in that relationship bank and make that connection? And if I can do all three, well, that's something I should be paying attention to. And then I try to personalize care based on knowing that person in their context. So I know that we're out of time and I will uh, end there. And, uh, and th thanks very much for inviting me. I really have learned a lot from you and appreciate uh, what you're doing here. I think you're doing some special things here, both in the system and in the community and at the, that, that interface. And I uh, appreciate you inviting me to spend some time with you.